And their motto is to protect and serve, but today the federal government says four East Haven police officers were not doing that. In fact, they say they were racial profiling, and the investigation has been going on for some time. It was intimidation, it was fear, it was, it was, that's, that's the way it, it works. Racial profiling diverts limited law enforcement resources away from finding actual criminal and national security threats. It also diminishes trust between law enforcement and affected communities, and in conjunction with that, violates fundamental rights of fairness and equality. In 2012, East Haven became a flashpoint for racial tension between police and ethnic communities in Connecticut. What happened in my country store is that the store owner uh, had been harassed over several months. The police were outside the store every day. The store owner had old license plates tacked to the wall. You would see them at bars and restaurants, typical things. And so uh, under the pretense that somehow that, that, uh, that they were uh, selling license plates out of the store, which was ridiculous, and ordered them to take, the, the police officers ordered them to take them down. The police officers were outside, and one police officer entered the store. I wanted to ask him a question. He pushed past me without answering me and walked straight to the back of the store. They said you have to take down all the license plates because they are illegal to have them up there. My husband began to take them down. It took a while because they were screwed in. Then, while they were taking them down, Reverend Manship showed up. In the 15 or 17 second video, uh, uh, basically uh, was an in in exchange between uh, the officer and myself, asked me a question what I was doing, taking a videotape. He said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do with that, that camera, came around and arrested me. For this community, the arrest of Reverend Manship was the last straw. Tension exploded onto the streets of East Haven. A community divided revealed a state split over cultural and racial lines. This is very hard for us. For many years, we have been really intimidated, afraid, so afraid to go out in the streets because they might stop us for any reason and that we would lose customers at the store. It's always been for me about protecting uh, the community and, and our parishioners here. People were invited to go and speak with uh, a, a team of law interns from the Yale Law School and they basically told them their, uh, gave them their stories of their encounter with the police department. The DOJ Civil Rights Division found a pattern and practice of racial profiling in the police department which brought about a consent decree, a court order, some, 70, some over nearly 70 pages of reforms that the police department in East Haven have to do. This led to the arrest of five officers in East Haven, arrested, tried, and convicted for civil rights violations and sentenced to 30 months in prison. The officers abused their positions of authority to deprive people of their constitutional rights under color of law. In simple terms, they behave like bullies with badges. For manship and the community of East Haven, justice had been served. While East Haven begins a healing process, racial tensions continue to flare up, not only in Connecticut, but across the nation. That deserves answers for their son.
We have allowed our criminal justice system to get out of balance. The violence has to stop. He said that we were being loud. He didn't like that we were talking in Spanish. I ended up getting put in handcuffs, getting slammed on the ground. I had scratches on my knees, scratches on my ankles, put in a cop car, used excessive force, and nothing was ever done. I put a complaint on the police officer after everything was said and done, but nothing was ever done. For the people that are supposed to protect you, act like you were, I, like I was an animal or something, you know what I mean? Like, that's not, I'm, I'm a human just like you. Just because I speak a different language doesn't make me any different than you. My definition of racism is someone else making fun of another group um, because they believe that they are better than them some way or they have a stereotype against them. Well, it's been seeming to get more relevant because of what we're seeing on the news or on social media about Ferguson and Tamir Rice and Eric Garner. Well, I've definitely seen racism towards the black community and the Latino community. In or, I think in order for it to be helped, I, I, I don't know like what, what, could, what we could do in order for that to be helped. It's kind of, because it's so one-sided, like the police want one thing, different races want another thing. I don't know how that could be resolved. With the mistrust on national and local levels, police and local activists are taking the first steps towards reconciliation one step at a time. Maria Gonzalez works with the Latino community in Torrington, Connecticut. Five years ago, she took the first step by contacting the mayor and asking for a meeting. When I got back from my house to, to open the door and, and have this meeting, there was a bunch of police officers outside. And I said, oh my God, I'm in trouble now. <laughs> and, and everybody was there waiting for me. So it was like probably 10 police officers that night. And like probably, I will say maybe 40 or 50 community members, you know, people from the youth. So we, we just started a meeting. It was very emotional. Uh, I don't think there was a, a, a dry eye at that meeting. Everybody was crying, especially the young people that was feeling the way that they was feeling uh, about, you know, what with the police. And one of the, one of the police officers, a detective that was there, he, uh, he told me that that night he went home and he couldn't sleep. Remember, because he was remembering everything that happened at that meeting and, and seeing them crying, you know, because I guess they didn't even know. The police they didn't even know. I would definitely say it's been different. Uh, like I said, at the time, I felt the tension. And, you know, I wasn't a driver or anything at the time, so I had never been pulled over and profiled like that or anything. But I feel that they definitely looked at us differently before the meetings with Maria and stuff, before the cultural workshops. They definitely had a different, a lower level of respect for us. Police across the state have begun to reflect on their interactions with minority communities and now are making changes. Turn on a movie. You know, turn on, put on any movie. What are you going to see when the cops show up? Usually it's going to be, a, a, you know, the racist cop. Uh, a TV show, what are you going to see? A racist cop. Turn on the news. It's stories about police brutality and, and racism and cops. And uh, so people have that, some people are going to have that, you know, image in their mind when we show up. So uh, cops know that and, and we have to be uh, cognizant of that and be extra careful to communicate as best we can. Uh, not come off uh, as military and, and overbearing and, and it's just a fact of society now. The job has changed. There's a, dis a stigma attached to being a police officer now uh, and a lot of it falls on us. There are so many police officers out there every day inspiring trust and confidence, honorably doing their duty, putting themselves on the line to save lives. There are police departments already deploying creative and effective strategies, demonstrating how we can protect the public without resorting to unnecessary force. When the relationship is better between us and the police and they're just doing their job instead of harassing us, the community doesn't look at us the same. They look at us as, oh, you know, we're regular people too. We're just like you. When it comes to relations between police and the communities they serve, responsibility lies with both sides to take the first steps towards improving communication and building respect. 
A house divided cannot stand. It is essential to overcome our prejudices and uphold a commitment to cultural acceptance nationwide. Uh, right now in Toronto, if something happened, because we're not perfect, I mean, things are going to happen, but if something happened now and people come to me or call me, I'm not gonna call the newspaper, I'm gonna call the chief. And I'm gonna say, chief, this is what's going on. So there are issues, there are always issues. There's communication issues. There's um, people think that there's humanitarian issues, but there's justice issues too. And our police force is trying very hard to overcome a lot of that. These things are gonna happen. Uh, that's not the time to reach out the, to the community and ask for support. You need to already be out there and with them and working together before these things happen. We live in the state of Connecticut in the, probably the most segregated state by economy. We have pockets of extreme wealth and pockets of extreme poverty. You gotta walk in other people's shoes. You gotta, you gotta come out of your own and allow, uh, allow your world to open up a bit more and getting to know people who are different than you.